welcome to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. I s- <laughs> what is happening? <laughs> just in time. That was like I perfect timing. Started. I don't even know what's going on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, they're changing the course in the uh, training room again. I, I could, door. I could, I, yeah, I can hear. I could not have planned a better intro. That oh was amazing. Goodness. Hi, everybody. Oh. <laughs> Welcome back to another episode of Human Factors Cast. I'm your host, Nick Rome. I'm joined today by Mr. Blake Arnsdorf. Howdy, howdy, howdy. There he is. Um, hang on. Let me, there we go. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, yeah, we're back. It's a Monday. Wait, what is today? Today is it July is Monday. 29th. Monday, Absolutely. 2019. You're listening to, maybe even watching Human Factors Cast. Um, I already introduced us. Hi. How are you, Blake? <laughs> I'm, <not> gonna... <laughs> I'm doing so well. Okay, so here's the thing, folks. Uh, Jeff is no longer with us. Uh, he, he's still alive. That sounded bad. He's still alive. Yeah. He's just not on the show here he, walking me through stuff. He's still pumping out content for us on yeah. the low. Yeah, but... he is. He is allowing us to take the reins. He trusts More so me. Nick taking the reins with the he video. Tr- he trusts me with this stuff, and I don't even trust myself. It so. is so good. You have it down and under control. Ah, we'll see. We'll see. Um, okay, so, yeah, we're getting noises from everything. This is great. It is. This so is going good. great, Blake. This I love gonna this. It's going to make the best podcast audio we've ever done. Yes, it's going to be fantastic. Uh, hey, we do have some excellent news stories. We do! Uh, this week. They're, they're pretty cool. So we got Elon Musk talking about Neuralink uh, and beginning to outfit human brains for faster input output uh scientists creating a prosthetic arm that lets patients feel again and toyota and their shuttle plans for the 2020 olympics but first you can find us on tuesday or sorry you can find us on youtube basically every monday now we're gonna try to pump these out every monday night since we're doing these live we can actually do these on monday nights which is very exciting um so anyway uh blake What's going on in your world? Man, my world feels very, very small right now. Just me and the dog hanging out, loving life, doing the same old, same old. But so, Nick, I I have a terrible confession. What's your what's your confession? I have another car story. You and your (laughs) privileged car, Blake. So you remember a couple weeks ago, I was telling you that like when the navigation's going It'll cut all the sound out through the rest of my car. Yeah, and that was you, a very cool, yeah, very you, cool, very, uh, um, what's, the, what's the word? Humble brag. Yeah, right? Is that a dog comb you have right there? What is that? That's for my beard. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> this show is already off the rails. <laughs> a dog comb? <laughs> no, but I definitely have poop. Is that part of your banter? It's absolutely <laughs> not. Uh, but I, f- I found a hidden feature the other day that I thought was funny, and I wanted to know if any other... Patreon or anybody else's experience. I was accidentally changing the volume to a song while the navigation needed to tell me something. It actually has an entire separate volume control that you cannot access anywhere else at any other time. Except for when... when they're talking. Okay. So you have to like interrupt the screen, take away any of the directions it's showing you, or to like manipulate and change the volume. Interesting. It's like the, it's funny the delay they've put on the interface when you change the volume. It's pretty long. Like it's a good three to five seconds of just like nothing on the interface except for icon that they've chosen for okay. volume. So I thought that was a weird way to kind of hide a feature you would only discover randomly. So what types of volume does that control? Does that control the navigation voice as well as the balance between the um, like the speakers? And- so it's just the navigation voice. So okay. It's basically just like turning it up or down. Okay. Um, our separate set of icons. But yeah, so that's how you could. Because I always wondered, like, why is her voice so soft? Is there any way I can even change it? Yeah. So it was just by happenstance, of course. Right. Well, if have. you read the manual, but you would know. You'd know all the things. <laughs> I would have so much more to talk about in my banter, all about just car things. A car things all day, every day. Yeah. But how are you, Nick? Um, I know it's I know it's been an intense week. Yeah, winding down, and getting ready for this big move. So, last week I, I mentioned that you know not having your personal artifacts displayed uh, in what you would consider your home has really been wearing me down. And if that what if I seemed crazy last week and kind of like um, what's the word dispirited? Is that a word? Like 
We'll make it one. We'll make it one. Yeah. So like. Sounds real. It feels about 10 times worse this week because this is the week of the actual move. And like, just to put it into context for everyone, I'm commuting three hours a day. That's going to go down to basically 40 minutes. Um, uh, what is what is it? Google dispirited. Yeah, dispirited. Having lost enthusiasm and hope, disheartened. Yes, that is exactly how I feel yeah. about everything. You're basically a thesaurus. Um, yeah, and I mean, there's a lot of change going on. Uh, there's big projects at work. There's like a bunch of life events that are overlapping, right? We got the move. We got the baby. Um, and then also there's like, you know, when it rains, it pours. We went to the vet the other day, and so that's a that's a bill. And then just today, my car. Uh, see, I have a, a 2015. And, oh, goodness. And my 2015 is already crapping out on me because I drive uh, 120 so much, miles a day. Right? Yeah, you like crush <laughs> it up and down so, the highway. Um, yeah, that's that's happening. So when it rains, it pours. Uh, stress levels are very high. And on top of all that, I now have to do the video stuff uh, because Jeff thinks I'm a big boy and I can handle this stuff. So we'll see how it goes. Got it under control for now. I think so, maybe. Um, but you know, it I think hasn't we'll... gone off the rails uh, yet. No, we're totally. This episode is already off the rails, Blake. It's I have really no normal. idea how we're going to rein it in, other than to say, you know what time it is. What times is it? Uh, it, it, it's human factors news. This is part of the show where we are talking everything in the field of human factors, uh, as long as it pertains to the field of human factors and uh, is related to human factors. It's, it's, you know, anything, what, cybersecurity? You Cyber. name it. What? We, I don't know. I'm just, I'm stalling so that way I can get all this stuff queued up and ready to go. All right, Blake, what do we got up first this week? Well, let's kick it off hard with some BCIs. So Neuralink, the Elon Musk startup, is working on technology that's based around threads, which it says can be implanted in the human brain with much less potential to impact the surrounding brain tissue versus what's currently used in today's brain-computer interfaces. The long term, Neuralink, Neuralink is really all about figuring out a way to achieve some sort of symbiosis with artificial intelligence for those who want that. Then. So in the near term, however, the aim is medical. So the plan is to use a robotic arm that Neuralink has created that operates somewhat like a sewing machine to implant these threads, which are incredibly thin, uh, about one third a thin piece of hair, deep, and they're implanting them deep within a brain tissue where it's capable of performing both read and write operations at a very high data volume. So Neur Neuralink scientists have mentioned in a briefing last week that the company has a long way to go before it can get anywhere near a commercial. The main reason for breaking the cover and talking about this more freely that what they're working on is so that they can actually have a better capability to open up papers and publish papers, which definitely makes things easier in terms of operation. So get expertise from other people, get the word out in the academic field, things like that. Nick, it's insane to me that this guy's entire startup is dedicated to making sure we can up with artificial intelligence in general. Yeah, I think a lot of people are critical of Neuralink um, and just BCIs in general. I think a lot of people kind of treat it as like the pie in the sky, uh, never going to happen. I think, you know, you have to start somewhere. And I think this is a great place to start where... It's this is uh this is interesting, right? Because it's basically just um one wire that kind of helps you with the read write functions, right? So uh yeah, I, I don't know. It's it's like one wire, it helps with the uh transfer of information. What I am not quite understanding with this is like it it, it is doing these read write things, but how is it sort of uh connecting to like, is it just connecting neurons within the brain? So that way, uh, this is acting almost like a accelerated axon for information to travel across. And once your brain understands that pathway, uh, you are making more efficient connections. Or is this, like, the beginning of, like, a, a spinal cord that you plug into the internet and, you know, can write information to your brain? Like, I, I'm just not quite sure what the intent, uh, intended use of just this... Um, you that know. like threads what their yeah. real purpose is. I think the biggest thing that they've released, right, is that it just they're trying to find something that they can integrate as a BCI that is allowing you to not really damage the surrounding tissue. 
I think sure. some of the concepts for how they're going to read and write and transmit information back and forth, I'm not sure that that's well enough defined by them, um, probably because they're in stage. I feel like the, they are still in the process of trying to figure out what can we put in somebody's brain to damage this issue. But that's been a problem for medical science for a long time. I mean, when you cut a tumor out, it can have you know adverse effects oh, on sure. your personality or on your abilities to decision make and things. How, so how do we avoid that if we're going to start actively putting stuff in? I think that, I think this is still in step one. But you bring up a good point. Our, they talk about being able to process this really high volume of information, which is along with like Musk's vision of being able to keep intelligence. So I'd say it's probably a combination of the two things you talked about. Being able to quickly and more efficiently make those associations or understand information, but also having some way to basically hook into the matrix, if you will, and gather that information in yeah i guess my biggest criticism is i'm not quite sure exactly what information is being transferred whether or not that info this is acting as just a um, transfer method uh, within the brain and then they're going to somehow externalize that connection at some point or if this is just like a um you know test for interfacing with the like i it's not very clear to me and um you know i i even watched about half of this presentation and um, maybe I'll throw that in the Patreon subscribers uh, feed as well for our listeners there. Um, Interesting with the amount of data volume they're talking about, right? Because it's almost as if you would have to add storage to your brain to be able to handle it. Or are, you, or are they going to start figuring out ways that you can use any person? Well, yeah, I'm wondering if you have like a, uh, you know, a, a 500 gig micro SD card on your brain, like what kind of information can that hold? Um, you know, you can hold a lot of text from, like, Wikipedia. So, like, if you find a way to access that uh, data card, you are effectively, like, able to download that information to your brain, and you can just reference anything quickly by looking at it, right? But it's that connection to that, and how do you output that to the brain that's the weird part? I don't know. In a this processable is... way or some, like, format that you can digest. Yeah, this is all, like, really sort of... Um, it's, it's like breaking new ground, and it's interesting, and uh, I, I don't know what to expect, honestly. Uh, it's cool. Yeah, it, it'll be interesting over time, and then somewhere in the article, it does mention Ed. Haha, I get what you did there. I see. There, yeah, not, trust me, I'm not a fan of puns. Uh, but one of the, <laughs> the bits that he go, goes through is talking about how you could even use something like this to maybe bypass or lessen the effects of depression, anxiety, sure. how that could play into it. I and thought that was kind of an interesting you application. Know, application of it instead of just you being basically a giant data server. Head. Right. I, I, like, how would something like that work, right? Is it, like, downloading... Um, like, like, are you downloading uh, treatment methods to your brain? Like, how... Or is it, like, restricting the way the brain is working? Because, I yeah. mean, it's able to be attached Does but it not intercept? interfere. Yeah. So it's like, I don't know, restricting, this probably doesn't even make any sense, scientists are idiots, yeah. but is it restricting, <laughs> like, certain, certain patterns, certain, like, I don't know, pathways in your brain, or lessening the amount of, like, impulses that you get from, like, a certain portion of your brain? Yeah, if you, if you bring up a great point, point Blake. Uh, if you are a neuroscientist, please write into the show and explain to us dummies how this works. Absolutely, because <laughs> it was not clear in presentation no <laughs> <laughs> but still an awesome i think it's an awesome venture and i think like applications like that and making these guys more accessible to a lot more people could help with different neurological just talk about and kind of ties into the next story a little bit with some of the stories we talked about in the past of being able to give people like their facilities back by interacting with their brain with like a bpi yeah well since you mentioned it what do we have up next all right so perhaps one of the most for profound yet underappreciated aspects of life is the ability to reach out with your hand, feel the world around you, whether it's fresh cut grass or the face of a loved one. So people, for people who have lost one, prosthetics may restore some functioning, but the sense of touch itself is often lost. However, scientists at the University of Utah say they, they've created technology that can return some degree of feeling for people with amputations. Technology is the result of a collaboration between several institutions University of Utah, 
One major contribution by the university researchers was development of the Utah Electrode Array, or the UC. So this UC provides an interface between a prosthetic hand and the user's remaining sensory and motor nerves in her arm. Nerves and the person's own thoughts help to operate the device. It happens through the surgical implantation of hundreds of electrodes directly next to nerve fibers. So they can then record from and listen to or stimulate a small subset of nerve fibers, which very selectively and reasonably comprehensively allow people to experience a wide range of specific sensory and motor signals, give you back some of that feeling to So it'll definitely take years at least before these devices are commercially available, though even if these tri trials like these and others go off a hitch, but that's still enough time for people living with limb loss today to have somewhat of a benefit of these advanced and more natural, natural prosthetes. So Nick, this is another awesome step in trying to give people kind of more, more of their life and independence back through, you know, technology of prosthesis. A lot of this over the past couple of years we've done this podcast. Yeah. I, it just keeps getting more and more like still in the R&D phase, but it'll be here sooner than we think. Yeah. I love it. Every time we talk about some way of giving people agency back, I don't, it's hard for people who are not in that position to understand just exactly how much this is life changing, right? Like when you lose something, um, it's very hard to, it's difficult to live with that and, and to cope a lot of times. Uh, and some people make the best of it, right? Like you still have, um, maybe, maybe like if they have a, a prosthetic arm, they're able to control it and grab things, uh, with very basic muscle movements. If you could feel, that's a whole nother tactile sense that like, um, you know, you've seen the cases of like people who squeeze too hard with their prosthetics and like shatter glass or whatever. Oh yeah, absolutely. And having that sense of touch and I, I don't know, did it mention pressure at all? Uh, because we definitely talked about pressure in other situations too, right? So each one of these um, sensory inputs getting closer and closer to transmitting that information to the user you can almost like almost replace an arm right at that point and and that's where we're going someday they'll be able to interface with these prosthetic devices and you won't even one there will be no difference for them with touch and sensing and healing um and there will be no sort of uh outward um indication that it is a prosthetic right some prosthetics are pretty good now and uh, sure. you know, I, I think we're getting a lot closer to that future. Uh, and the the Luke hand from Empire Strikes Back and Jedi, right? Absolutely, like oh. way more to the bionic arm, a prosthetic. Yeah, and I think some it's kind of si a silly and a bit of a stretch, but like something like combination of Neuralink and technology like this, where you're able to if you're able to actually speed up, you know, the impulses the amount of information that you're reading in the brain, and maybe that helps cut some of the kind of amount of electrodes having to implant here, leftover nerve fibers in your arm was, or whatever, then you may not have access to. And now the prosthesis has given you, given you a little bit more control that feels more accurate. I would imagine that part of the, part of the issue, like you, the pressure of cracking a glass, if you have all... I w I'm not sure, but I'm wondering now if even like being able to sense and touch things, if it's close to one to one, so you start feeling something and you're seeing it, is it transferring that information to you quick enough that like, get the grip strength you're using is enough to tell you like, okay, I should stop right. pressuring or putting so much pressure on this glass, or is it a little bit more of a lag? So I think that's obviously why you may only see these not commercially available for a while, because I think pass almost and trying to cut that latency time between taking an action with your arm and feeling all the patients that come with it but this stuff is always so cool to learn about yeah and, and like so the thing that i'm nerding out about is that the 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 way that this connects to the human um this is i i don't know if this has been done in other prosthetics they're taking hundreds of nerve fibers or, or they're taking hundreds of electrodes and plugging them in directly next to nerve fibers. So that way uh, you're getting all that 
resolution in in um, the muscle movements that you are performing. Because it's literally it's really creating awesome. it. It's like an integrated system. You're yeah. re- you are almost making that prosthetic arm much more of now just not like something else to either you know give you some facility or agency back. But now it's like it's literally a part of you. Yeah. You're, to the point where you can you can understand what's going on with it. You can feel it a lot more. It's it's pretty insane what they're and the fact that that like they're going as deep to like connect nerve, connect things back as close to nerve fibers as they can make this thing run and people. Yeah, I don't know. Is is there like some? Um, I didn't see. Is there some way that this thing connects to uh, like you basically put all the nerve fibers in and it's like a hub that you can like disconnect it from? Um, because I mean, you'd have to charge this in some way, right? Yeah, I guess you would have to, right? Or is it like you just keep it on and then you plug it in the USB at night while you sleep or something? Um, or is it solar powered? I don't know. Like, I'm there's a lot of ways they could be charged, but yeah, I would assume you would have to, you know, disconnect it and recharge it once in a year. I don't think they they don't necessarily show like the connection piece. Yeah, that'd be cool to see. Like, I I would want to see the interface between the actual human and the system. Um, and you know, I, I'm not seeing that, but. Super cool. I guess I, the one thing I wonder too is like how much, how invasive is it? it right, it is a surgical procedure. Yeah, is what it they say. Definitely has to be. Yeah. What is that? What does it leave? Leave almost like a lack of a better way of putting it, like a like a plug into a wall. Yeah. Is that basically what your arm becomes? Right? Yeah, that's what I'm asking. Is yeah. like, is that an interface? And if not, like I can imagine, you know, you basically get an implanted rotator cuff. Um, that you basically plug on this prosthetic to, and you know, that's kind of how it would connect. And that's at least in my mind how I'm imagining it. I think kind of based off some of the images they do show that that is more towards what they will lean towards designing. I think right now, obviously, like it's wrapped on kind of surgical gauze and stuff like that. Right. Um, and then it it looks like it's it, for both pictures it's actually already connected to battery. Yeah, still like, what does this look like in the uh, base of the question? But it's yeah, like, it looks like they like got this guy. Looks like just taking grapes off of a vine, and it, obviously this picture is probably taken to make it look as awesome as possible. But able to have a lot of dexterity, often at least I don't know, lightly touching this. Yeah, so there's a couple things that I think we haven't talked about yet. Is that the fact that uh, because this is plugging into, we've skirted around it. Because it is plugging directly into all those nerve fibers, it is giving you that dexterity and that um, sort of resolution with control. And I'd be, I don't think the article goes into how dexterous the actual prosthetic is. However, uh, you can imagine some very complex systems that um, very complex robotics that would allow the same type of range of motion that a human hand would have. And, um, you know, the closer we get to that and the more sort of we understand how each muscle fiber controls every finger muscle associated with our hands, uh, that's, that's, a whole, that's a whole interesting piece of it that, um, you know, we haven't really talked about yet. And then the fact that they're being, they're able to feel things. It's, not only reading the input, but it's writing back to the nerve fibers, and that is how the sense of touch is conveyed. It's it's writing that information back into your nerve fibers, and that gets translated up to your brain. It's so cool. It's really neat. It's pretty awesome. Yeah, I, I nerd out about this. All right, uh, got anything else to say about this one? I think that's all I got. Okay, well, uh, we are going to take a quick break, and we will be back to break down the rest of the news stories right after this. Human Factors Cast strives to bring you the best in Human Factors chatter every week. We pack news, interviews, reviews, and overall fun conversations into each and every product that we put our seal of approval on. But we can't do it without you. You see, the Human Factors Cast network is 100% listener supported. All the funds that go into running this show come from the listeners. That's why we're giving back to our supporters on Patreon now more than ever. 
Pledges start at just $1 per month and include rewards like 24-7 access to our exclusive Human Factors Cast Slack channel, personalized professional reviews, and Human Factors Cast Infinite, a Patreon-only podcast where the topic is Human Factors Etc. We're always updating our rewards, so stop by patreon.com slash humanfactorscast to see what support level may be right for you. Thank you all, and remember... All right. Well, speaking of Patreon, um, I do want to say we have on the horizon here, we're, we might do a Chernobyl, uh, the HBO series. We may do a Human Factors cast infinite commentary on that. Like, that might be a fun one to do. That one would be a fun one to yeah. do. You, have you, you seen any of it? No, no, no. No, I haven't either. Yeah, so, you yeah. and I will just take a Saturday, Sunday, whatever, and just go Power through it through. Yeah. and drop those. Yeah. Uh, also on the horizon, starting this week, actually, we're going to try something uh, new with our Patreon. Uh, we're going to be dropping a, uh, I don't even know what to call it. It's like a it's like condensed, condensed, condensed version of the show, right? Bite size. Yeah, it's like news only, right? So n- no Patreon commercial, um, no banter, no community outreach with the Reddit. It's just the news. So if that's something that you're interested in, you can jump in at the $1 level. Um, and uh, we'll be providing those uh, condensed accelerated bite-sized uh accelerated 20 minutes 20 minute episodes uh just perfect for your commute uh <laughs> okay all right we got one more story uh wait actually before we go on to the news the wah, oh, i'm messing everything up all right before we go on to the last story i just want to thank all of our friends over at uh, gizmodo uh and Tech Crunch for all of our news stories this week. If you want to follow along, you can follow us. Uh, you can follow us on Slack because we post those as we find them. And uh, yeah, all the links to the original articles are there for you to find. Okay, Blake, we have one more news story. It's a little bit of short news week because uh, we had some stuff going on, like moving and car troubles and uh, dogs and general life things. whatever. General life things. All right, uh, we got one more news story. What do we got up next? All right, so in 2020, thousands of people will converge on Tokyo for the 2020 Olympic and Paralympic Games. And infrastructure will certainly be tested. Toyota is getting into the mix to handle some of the ways people will get around the city and the Olympic venue. Last Thursday, Toyota unveiled a new product called the Accessible People Mover, or APM, designed for the Olympics and Paralympic Games. The aim of the vehicle, according to Toyota, is to provide mobility for all and to serve as a so-called last mile problem solver. So this means that the vehicle can transport as many people as possible, including elderly, pregnant women, families, children, and people with disabilities. These vehicles will actually come with two different modes, basic and relief. The basic version is a low speed, short distance battery electric vehicle. It'll be used to transport visitors and staff within grounds. And the the relief model will be used for emergencies and with space for stretchers and in. So other vehicles include the JPN Taxi, which can accommodate people using wheelchairs, and Toyota's iRoad, a standing writing device designed to support staff at the such as security officer. At. So it looks like Toyota's really getting in the mix for helping making sure people get around during the 20 20- Yeah, it's really cool. Um, I always love how the Olympics sort of uh, encourages innovations in technology uh, at a scale that maybe hasn't been seen before. So this is just like one... Okay, so let's let's talk about what logistics the Olympics causes for a big city, right? So one thing that happens is you have this city that is full to capacity already and has a bunch of people from every country basically coming in and disrupting the way that infrastructure works and one way to get around it is to basically force the city to come up with innovative ways to solve those problems this is one of those ways absolutely yeah it's cool to see the different like concept designs that people, like companies like toyota come up with to basically solve some of the problems like taking a lot of the space age stuff that we look and see, but I mean, at the end of the day, this is stuff. I have a, I don't know, over-engineered golf cart looks like, but it looks like it's meant to hold and handle 
a lot of different situations that I'm going to have to deal with with getting people from the venue within the venue. It's different emergency situations. Do. Just things that are ultimately going to allow to transport the higher volume of people that they're now dealing with the infrastructure of the city. I think you, you made a really great point. It's events like this really test technology at scale. Right. So it's not just like designing for a few people. This is like, for, I don't even know the amount of people who can go and end up going to the Olympic Games. Some hundreds of thousands, I guess. At the very least, yeah. yeah. But, and the thing is that this... This will be like a trial by fire for autonomous vehicles. Um, we have autonomous vehicles. However, something like this, where there's such a massive demand for transportation, um, is going to be a really great case study for automation and the benefits of it, right? So if you have, like, I don't know, let's say, like, this is, this is wishful thinking, but let's say one in ten um, cars on the road at any given time is one of these Toyota pods. That will go a long way to say, hey, look, if 10% of all automobiles on the freeway or the roads uh, are these autonomous vehicles that work together, cooperate together, um, and communicate together to effectively transport people in a timely manner, uh, I think there's going to be a, a pretty strong push, right? Like, so they, they're saying 200 of these things uh, out there. That's not one in 10. But uh, if they are working together, kind of like a swarm, you can almost use that as like a, I don't know how this is going to happen. Are these going to be like shuttles that kind of um, rotate, right? So that way they're always kind of in this station or like, uh, there's still a lot of questions I have, obviously, but I'm just really excited to see what types of conclusions we draw about automation in a populated, dense, um, taxed infrastructure environment. Uh, this, this is going to be awesome. Yeah, I, mean, I, I it love could, this. It could really, it could either make or break it, but I think in a lot of ways, because of the way that they're planning to use it, and it, like you have two modes, there's only so many ways it's going to be used throughout, like going to and from the venue, and then with help that it help to allowing people to one, get comfortable with it in kind of a, a small space. It's not like taking you across the city. It's much more of like last mile transportation. Right. And they mentioned that specifically. That's before, right? Yeah. Or it's like it's used in tandem with like a kind of got comfort of having the people that need to be there in a situation like that. So I think it's a it's awesome design. I think a lot of the they've taken into account a lot of different types of people, population types and sizes of people especially when you're talking about you can't really focus on one certain population I'll gotta design for the highest and lowest here in this at people coming from so many different countries life with gonna be a pretty interesting yeah um i'm already noticing a problem with the way that we do these videos <laughs> oh no <laughs> this video has nothing to do with this <laughs> It's got like oh, it's just robots. Like and, yeah, and I think it's like content. a Toyota promotional thing. I, yeah. There's cars in it. That that's uh, yeah, that's something fun. I think though, like, so so yeah, we're running an advertisement for Toyota now. Anyway, it's whatever. It's, <laughs> Good old Yoda ad. We'll figure it out. We'll figure it out. Um, but yeah. I don't even know. It looks like they're also going to integrate. Some, I just caught this at the end of the article. <laughs> they're going to integrate something else called the Toyota Concept I. It's a car that recognizes a driver's emotions and preferences by making conversation with it. Ooh, that's a whole other news that's, story. That's like. insane. <laughs> oh, man. Okay, well, let's... That's, yeah. All right. Uh, well, um, you know what time it is. Yeah, what time is it, Nick? Well, is it time for another section? It came from... It came from... It came from... I don't know. I don't know what's going on here anymore. Oh, we're here. Um, Jeff, come back. We need you, I think. Anyway, yeah, it's it came from Reddit. Uh, and you, see, like, everything's all messed up. I don't even know what's going on. This is a, uh, this is a nightmare. Nightmare. All right. It's only the second show. <laughs> it is only. With, with you Nick know what? It's the, the rails. it's the first one that I'm on my own doing all this, so I don't feel terrible about it. 
Um, you don't even have the hotkeys yet. I mean, you're having to do a lot of manual stuff. You're killing it. I yeah, I don't even have the hotkey set up, so we're we're like just kind of working through this. Anyway, we have uh, time for both of these Reddit questions, so I'm just gonna go ahead and go for it. Do it. Uh, this first one here is posted by um, Nietzsche, ten twenty three, uh, and this is actually on the Human Factor subreddit, which is exciting. Uh, Nietzsche goes on to write, "Hi, I have some questions, and that's actually the title of the post." So. There's a couple questions here. Um, you know what? Actually, we might not get to the second question today because this is a lot of questions. So let's just dig in and see what's up with some of these questions. All right. I'm a rising undergraduate junior in, a col in college who's majoring in psychology. Uh, I stumbled upon human factors, and it sounds very interesting, but I had some questions about it going forward. Okay. You ready for these questions, Blake? Let's I'm going to throw these it. at you. Rapid okay. fires. One. When applying for graduate school, should I look for cognitive psychology or something more human factors related? Go one by one these. And yeah, I'm just gonna I'm gonna survey. Okay. okay. Number two, how much math and engineering should I know if I plan to go plan on going into this field? Is it math and engineering intensive? Oh, these are weak points of mine. Three, is there any coursework I should be taking to prepare myself to potentially go into this field? Is there anything I should be doing as an undergraduate? Four. Are there any states where the job market demand is particularly high? Five. Can anyone describe what exactly role, what exactly the role you play as a typical human factors engineer, psychologist in a work? Um, so uh, they'll go on to write, I, I'd appreciate if someone could address these questions just to better help me understand the field and what I might be getting into. Well, turn away now while well, you still can. Uh, that's my advice. No, okay. Let's go through these one by one. All right, so the first one here. When applying for graduate school, should I look for a cognitive psychology program or something more human factors related? Well, before, I would not have, know, not have necessarily known what to tell you, but if you're interested in human factors and hopefully you're able to maybe take a human factors course at your college, I'm not sure. I don't know that that's as widely spread. But if not, there are online courses that you can look into. But ultimately, the answer to question one for me would be, do you want to focus on cognitive psychology or do you want to work in kind of the applied field of human factors? Or even, you, I mean, you can work in the academic field of human factors as well, but if you want to do something specific human factors related, I'd say going to a human factors course is the best way, way to go. And a lot of that for me is the methodology that you learn. Which, uh, you know, theory that you will get from cognitive psychology, but it's unlikely you're going to methodology ability testing or how to put together you know a full flight study that's focused on human performance but nick what would you say um it, yeah I, I would say go for the human factor stuff if you can find a program that's human factors focused especially if that's something that you want to get into i think you'll get a good background in cognitive psychology i just feel like i i I I feel like my opinion is biased because we are on a show called Human Factors Cast. So if you are interested in human factors, go for that. However, um, I will say I tend to think, and maybe you can agree or disagree with me, Blake, but disagree. I tend to think that cognitive psychology as a degree is a little bit more, um, it, you could go for more jobs. And I, it's a little bit more flexible, whereas human factors is very much uh, user focused. And, and uh, I feel like you would almost lock yourself into the field, not to say that cognitive psychology couldn't do human factors. I just, I feel like it's a little bit more general. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So I, that's kind of my two cents with that one. I, it, like I said, I, I wouldn't say it's a, necessarily a bad thing but if you are interested in human factors and love it uh like blake and i do every every week you know we talk about human factors and we love it so much um wish there's a way to like zoom in on my dead inside face there probably <laughs> is uh anyway yeah so that's that's my two cents <laughs> yeah i mean nick is right though if you, you can get away kind of with a cognitive psychology degree it, the only reason i said that if you're gonna bother like if it was human factors and that's what you're interested in, and you're going to go to graduate school, I'd say go to a human factors program. Um, but I think either way is a great choice, especially if you're interested in psychology as a whole. Yeah. All right. Uh, question two here. How much math and engineering should I know if I plan on going into this field? 
Athen Engineering Intensive? I'm going to say that it depends. Should Can we, like... Where's the soundboard? Jeff, we need the thing. Give us the thing where it depends, just comes in from the sides and does the... Anyway. In rainbows it's from like a Make unicorn. it voice activated, so that way anytime we say it depends, it just comes uh, in. Anyway, okay, so it does depend. So, so I'm actually... Uh, okay, I said it depends, but there's not a lot of times that I'm doing... There is no times I'm doing, like, trigonometry during the day or, you know, oh, really? doing differential equations at my desk. Um, so it's just, that's not, like... That part of the engineering side of things I'm not really involved in. I will say something I've experienced recently is I have had to pick up a math textbook again and start Ooh. learning a lot of stuff. Interesting. Like um, for a specific project that I'm working on that deals with like a lot of mathematic calculations and then writing kind of the statistical programming behind it and how that'll translate to like a JavaScript thing. Okay. So there has been like a need to pick up and learn some mathematics again, but it's not... So intensive that my everyday requires me doing a lot of calculations. And two, we live in 19, which is beautiful. So you can either find tools on the internet that'll help you get what you want, or you can write them yourself. If you Wolfram wanna, wanna alpha that bitch. There you go. See, <laughs> there it is. Um, so yeah. no, you don't necessarily need it, but it's good to know. It is good to know, and I I can vouch for that side of things too. I don't use it. Um, you might experience like statistics in your uh in your in your coursework um you know a lot of uh, speaking at least just from experience a lot of usability studies and stuff like that is less uh focused on the statistical analysis and more just kind of like trial by fire what can what kind of results can we glean from this data set absolutely um however there there are uh entire user researcher positions at companies that deal with that statistical analysis so um, you know, that, that can be a strength of yours if you decide to go for a person who data crunches, uh, and that's a lot of math and statistics. And, but like Blake said, there's a lot of programs out there that can help you with that. Uh, so take that with a grain of salt. I mean, like, I wouldn't say don't, don't worry about it, but I, I would also say don't worry about it. That kind of brings up a good point <laughs> that maybe, yep, it's not really a specific question but also think about what you want to do Do want to do do you want a ux researcher position that could really benefit from having some intensive hf engineering style degree work or if you really like you know the analysis portion of cognitive psychology studies then okay maybe that's something for you to look in so also understand kind of where your strengths lie in terms of things you like to do that are related to psychology right and then as you learn about human factors, what what is it about human factors you like to do? Then you, that'll help guide you through. I need really intensive engineering math skills. Do I need to know how to code? Do I need to be a, a visual designer? There's lots of different avenues you can take. I think any degree, but specifically a human factors degree nowadays and run with it. That's a great segue into, into number three here. Is there any coursework I should be taking to prepare myself to potentially go into this field? Is there anything I should be doing as an undergraduate? That's a really good question. I feel shameful that I don't have an a-, a direct answer to the first one. Shame. Shame. Um, I don't know. I would say I would say again. Look for if you if you don't have a, like a intro to human factors course at the school that you're going to, look for like a one online. I know there's a couple of universities that offer them online. Um, you can also look into different organizations like HFES has a lot of great learning content. So does like Action, I can't remember the IXDA, something like that. There's a lot of great online material for checking out and learning about human factors, experience, design, yeah. and research, blah, blah, blah. In terms of what you should be doing as an undergrad, I would make sure two things. Again, if there's a human factors program of any sort at your school, Join your local HFES chapter or whatever related organization there may be at the school. Start talking with people. Yeah. If there's a program, they start trying to understand what research is going on at your school. And if there are any like interesting labs that you'd like to be a part of, if you are just in a school that offers like a lot of cognitive psychology research opportunities, I would get my hands wet in that. Because not I started in animal learning and behaviors and an avenue factors but uh, that humans, kind humans of are in. yeah they definitely are um but it, it all kind of the experience helps you get places you want to go 
Yeah, I would say, um, and this might be unpopular opinion or controversial <gasps> or whatever, uh, you are going to get human factors coursework need in a human factors graduate program. I think there are some things that can help you understand a little bit better the basis of, I mean, if you're already in psychology, that's good. Maybe stretch out in some of the other tangentially related human factors areas. So like engineering, maybe take an engineering course, just basic, just to get yourself uh, familiar with that. Um, I also wouldn't stretch yourself too thin. Like if you're, this is part of the controversial piece. Like if you are trying to get into grad school, focus on what you're doing now and try, like maybe maybe this is controversial in the sense that like you know just focus on your grades and try to get a good gpa to get into a good school like but you know if that means taking easy classes that's part of it you can you can work hard when you get to graduate school like if you know you're competent like that's that's part of it anyway uh i would say though if you are studying a certain track, like if you're an engineering student, maybe take a psych course, cognitive psychology. If you're a psych student, maybe take um, an engineering course or a design course, right? So just kind of get yourself familiar with the terminology that those disciplines use, because that can go a long way. We talk about communication a lot on this show uh, with developers, with designers, and just getting the lingo down can go a long way. Um, as for things you can be doing as an undergraduate, do your research on programs, obviously, uh, and any supplemental material you can find online about human factors. Like Blake said, there are some online resources. I know there's a lot of courses like take for UX stuff. Uh, start your networking now. If you can go to HFES and find a person that, you know, you, you can make a connection with, maybe they'll take you as their student or something. I don't know. So like there's, there's stuff you can do. Absolutely. And Nick brought up a good point that I realized actually is happening at my the university. I went to her. You should also look for, even if you're not necessarily design inclined, you may learn methodology that'll be helpful. Uh, look for any UX courses that are taught at your university or again, similarly UX chapters, of, whether it's meetups or to school, just to get you exposed to different things and i think the methods might be worth kind of getting under your belt like just thinking that yeah uh okay next question here are there any states where the job market or demand is particularly high Nick, i'm gonna have to toss this one to you if you i'm know gonna it, have to toss this one to you blake because i don't know either i have no uh, idea this would be a, a good google if you're really looking i would say that i've seen California. more and more factors job postings in California and definitely UX research positions in California. Yeah. I mean, look, California is the easy answer for us. We are in California. Our minds are in California. Um, there's a lot of companies in Silicon Valley that are in California. Um, there's some human factors work in San Diego, lots in LA, um, lots in LA, lots in, lots in actually Las Vegas. Oh, really? Lots of human factors. Or like a lot of UX research. Looking, people basically looking you to be like a data scientist plus people, like okay. having that understanding of the analytics behind things, but really about like, okay, how does this impact you? Does that really that translate to actionable? Yeah, I would imagine any of the major cities in the US probably has something in some capacity. Um, it yeah, uh, that's kind of my thought. But like, if you were talking about just a man, maybe looking at where a booming city is. Like, I know uh, as of a couple years ago, um, city in Tennessee. What was it? What is that city? Uh, Nashville. No, it's um, uh, it's still booming. It's where Google Fiber was. Uh, oh, I have no idea. Uh, is it Chattanooga? Yeah, Chattanooga. Yeah, yeah, there we go. yeah. They, they were kind of booming a couple years ago, and I'd imagine you'd find a couple, couple positions there. So maybe look to where there's a lot of growth. Um, that's if you're U.S. focused. I mean, there's there's U, U.X. and human factors jobs all across the globe. So you know, if you do want to travel abroad, um, that's another big one. If you're if you're interested in the global market, like looking into companies. 
I don't know. I I remember when my stepdad got sick at first. That's where I started looking. There was a lot of need in Europe actors, practitioners, and UX designers and UX researchers. So if you're open to a global market or have like some reason to be living, you know, across the pond or wherever it may be, There's that's a good demand. place to look. Your demand. Yeah. Got some? I don't. Okay. I'm right. looking for like a nice breakdown of this. If anybody happens to find one or know one, throw it in our Slack. Yeah, throw it in our Slack and, and be sure to check back. All right. Uh, last one here. Can anyone describe what exactly the role you play as a typical human factors and technologist in a work setting? Uh, so usually I have people on the couch. Oh, tell you how they feel. How they feel. Oh. I get that one, and I also get, uh, what am I thinking right now? A psychologist, not psychic. I don't know why people always... Why? It's why the, it's, where that came from would be interesting to find out. Yeah. Like, I guess at some point, psychologists were equated as mind readers. Whatever. Phrenology is real. Uh, <laughs> Absolutely. So is frontal lobotomy. It's yes. Everybody. Uh, human factors does not endorse. No, okay. It's not. So what do you do in your typical role as a human factors engineer or psychologist? So I really hope that each tw- 1023 is going to listen to this because you and I have very different roles with you. the same title. You. Um, so I spend a lot of my day in design meetings where I'm going over concepts that I've come up for mock-ups of interfaces or concepts of you know, services, whatever it may be, and going through them with my team, explaining design rationale. Why did I come up with this? How does this benefit user needs? What requirements does this meet for the project that we're working on? That kind of stuff. And getting feedback from either my team, external stakeholders, developers, and then bringing that back to my desk and rolling it up and trying to start again a lot of times. Or trying to roll in new features and deliver you know, spec sheets to developers every day. Uh, so that's how I spend generally almost every day. Cause I, I've erred on the side of, I like to some of the visual design aspects and some um, little bits of code in for like prototyping and things like that. But I've done much more of the, a little bit of upfront research and then translating that into design decisions. Yeah. So uh, that's my day to day. Yeah. And so I would say that my day uh, kind of revolves around some of the feedback, a lot of interfacing with external stakeholders, um, where that, and what that usually manifests itself is is emails, like lots of emails. Lots of emails. And it's it's a lot of what you described is explaining rationale that I get fed from others on the project, um, you know, or something like that, where you're explaining uh, what's changed and why and and. Uh, how we got to that conclusion. You're also talking about like what types of user things we have coming up and what types of questions we're going to ask there, uh, soliciting feedback and putting together the materials for those user events, going to the user events. So there's like there's like the stuff that you do, which is more of the design uh, stuff and taking feedback from internal and external stakeholders. Uh, and then kind of like on on my side of the gamut, it's like organizing user events and, and getting materials prepared um, and interfacing with uh, folks, other folks on the team. Um, yeah, it, it just kind of depends on the project too. Like it, it kind of depends, like, said it again. It depends. Every day. <laughs> we at least say Every it day. four times. Every day. If you get away, you know what? I, I'm curious. Maybe I just posted in the Slack, but like if you say those two words at least once a day, uh, in your in your job, in your or if you don't, like, what do you say instead? Because those two words, I've like, you and I have been in meetings, Blake, where those two words come up, and we just look at each other and give a stupid look. Like, it's like, damn it, <laughs> it's everywhere. It is it, anything psychology related. It just comes up across. It doesn't have to be human factors. Yeah, like psychology. Period. It just ends. Okay. No concrete answer. And when I hear it, uh, when, you know, I'm just by myself, I, I look at Blake metaphorically. And, <laughs> and I break the fourth wall and just look at Blake wherever he is. Exactly. Okay. Uh, we got time for one more here, Blake. Awesome. Uh, this one here is by uh, Chief K240. Uh, not the other way around. Uh, this one's called Finding a Mentor. How did you guys go about finding a solid mentor in UX design? Well, the way this happened for me... That's what he's asking. How did it happen for you? 
2015. Yeah. You started at Pacific Science. Yeah. Yeah. That's how I found him. What? <laughs> no. <laughs> I. So <laughs> this will be interesting because I don't know that I've ever actually found a mentor. Like I've I've like come across people that I've worked with that I've either admired their work and tried to emulate what they do. Okay. Um. There's been other times that people have I guess given me advice about my career. Um, which a lot of that came from when I was doing volunteer work for UXPA. Right. The president of that company gave me a lot of advice about like how to go about getting into UX or being a UX designer if that's something I really wanted to do and what my like resume. Uh, but I don't know that I've ever found like a solid mentor that I could just go to to ask questions to or anything like that. I just emulate a lot of different people from various aspects of my life and um, some way that in, I see it impacting the way I design. So, huh. I don't know. Do you, do you have a mentor or have you ever had like a specific person that you go to for this stuff? I not would say. It doesn't have to be UX design, of course. Yeah, you know, no. Human I, factors or whatever. I would say my graduate advisor, that's like my mentor. Like he is my mentor. Um, I, I wouldn't consider him a mentor for human factors stuff. Uh, I would consider him a mentor for like research methodology, absolutely. Psychology, absolutely. Um, however, like his expertise was never in human factors, and so that's where I kind of had to go outside and find others who were, um, you know, like you. Like I just look at who's doing what out there uh, and hope for the best. Uh, jets overhead. I don't know if you can hear. Me. Um, yeah, I I don't know. Like I I don't have a mentor for UX or human factor stuff. So sure. I guess the closest thing would be this guy sitting right across the street from me. Across the street. Yeah. Who is that? I don't know. He's out there. Uh, he's out there he's out flying there. that plane. That's who it is. <laughs> That's who it is. The pilot of that plane. Somebody please. Help. Um I don't know. So if if you figure out how to find a mentor in the field that you're interested in, please yeah. back. I'd love please to know. Let us How'd know. you go about it? Yeah. Do that. Uh, okay. Like social media. Yeah. Interact. I don't know. It depends on where you are, how you want to connect with somebody. That kind of I don't know. Blake, we're getting out of here. It's, oh. uh, it's, that's it for today, everyone. Let us know what you guys think of the news stories this week. If you, uh, Patreon supporter, uh, check out those new, uh, truncated versions of the show. We're going to, we're going to throw those out there. For the rest of you, you can head on over to our Slack, uh, and join us on any of our social channels at Android Podcast. If you want to write into the show, we read those over Reddit posts. You can write into the show at humanfactorscast.com. If you like what you hear, want to support our show, you can leave us a review on your podcast medium of choice. Or consider supporting us on Patreon. For one dollar a month, you can get the truncated version of every show. Uh, and of course, you can always reach us on our home on the web, humanfactorscast.com. I want to thank Mr. Blake Arnstorf for being on our show today. Uh, you're on the show every week. Where can our listeners go and find you if they want to find out more about mentorship? Well, you guys can always ask me about mentorship in the Human Factors Cast Slack, or you can find me across the internet at Don't Panic You. As for me, I've been your host, Nick Rome. You can find me across social media at Nick underscore Rome. Thanks again for tuning in to Human Factors Cast. Until next time. It depends. It depends.